Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar series for December 2023 attempt. My name is Hassan Dosani, and today and tomorrow we will have a two-day exam-focused webinar on SBL. Right, so let us quickly jump into it. Let me share my screen. All right, are you guys able to see my screen clearly? Excellent. All right, so let us start. So what we will be covering in today's webinar, so a very brief introduction to SBL for those students who are giving SBL for the first time, uh, something about the pre-seen material changes which happened from the last attempt, we will discuss all the formats. We will discuss professional skills and how to score maximum marks. Most important, we will discuss the various exam techniques and then tips from global prize winners. That's very interesting. We have two global prize winners. Both of them scored 92 marks and they were the global highest marks. So. Um, I had spoken with them and what are their tips and techniques we, I will share with you guys. We will cover technical articles, we will do question practice, then I will share the list of important topics and the study plan for last three weeks. Right, so lots to cover. Previous webinars, so, you know, uh, basically I will try to cover everything uh, in this webinar, but if you want to do a full case study, then these two webinars are recommended to you. If you look at these two webinars, I have solved full case studies. This is more applicable for self-study students, right? The, the paid students, we will be doing full case studies in the live classes, right? How to ask question? You have to type your question in the chat box, okay? There is no mic allowed today because of the large number of students. So you will have to type your question in the chat box and every few minutes I will stop and go through the chat box. However, please keep in mind that your questions should pertain to the slide under discussion. All right. I will not be able to answer general questions. For all general questions, I will have uh, I have a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Right. So please, no irrelevant questions right now. And any kind of question I will take towards the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Okay. A quick introduction of myself. I am the CFO of an insurance company based in Dubai for last almost 13 years now. I sit in the board of directors and uh, teaching is my passion. And uh, I have conducted numerous webinars for ACCA as well. But the most important thing is my WhatsApp number here. Those of you who don't have it, please save my WhatsApp number so that you can stay in touch with me. All right. Also, uh, we have a global WhatsApp group for SBL. If you are part of it, then well and good. If you are not part of it, then this is the link of the global WhatsApp group. Okay. I think let me share this link with you. Um, I'll try to share it. No, I'm not able to copy from here. So maybe later. Okay. 
SBL pass rate. So SBL pass rate for the previous attempt, the September attempt was 50%, which is quite good. And on an average, SBL pass rate for the last seven, eight attempts has been pretty consistent. And it is one of the best pass rates amongst all the other strategic professional level peppers. So this is kind of good news, right? Now, SBL is very, very different. And um, I have discussed this slide in all my orientation, so I don't want to really go into it again. Um, the two important thing is that 20% of the paper is professional skills marks. So 20 marks out of 100 is professional skills. So you guys really need to focus a lot on professional skills so that at least you can secure the 20 marks, right? And the second interesting thing is 50% of paper is common sense. So common sense means that it does not directly pertain to any chapter, any topic, any models. You just need to use the, the exhibits and frame your answer using your logical mind, right? So um, this can only come from practice how to apply your common sense and answer a question so practice is really important because 50 percent of the paper is based on common sense now this is a very important slide that I've always suggested my students that whenever you are attempting SBL paper don't think like a student. Think like a CFO. Think that you are the CFO of that company. If you were the CFO, what would you have done? It's a mindset change. Yeah, I know that you are not the CFO. You don't have any experience. But still, there is no harm in feeling that you are the finance director. And automatically, your thought process will broaden. And you will start thinking in the on the larger picture. SBL will become a lot easier if you feel that you are the finance director or the CFO. And you are talking or explaining your point to the board of directors, right? So when I sit on the board, I think like a CFO, what will be the implications on the business? And then I explain my point to the CEO and the directors. So my language, my way of explaining automatically changes. Surprisingly, both the global prize winners who scored 92 marks, they both had used this technique. And a lot of students who have scored more than 70, 75 marks, I speak with them and most of them have applied this technique that when they enter the exam hall, they think or feel that they are the CFO and they are entering the board rather than entering as a student in the exam hall. Please, whenever, whenever you practice, wear the hat of a CFO and slowly and gradually, you will see the improvement, right? Now, this is a very important slide. So why students, they fail SBL? And this is from the ex various examiner's report. So on one side, I have identified the errors or the mistakes made by the students as per the examiner. And on the other hand, I have given some solution how you guys can avoid it, right? So the first and foremost mistake by student is that answers not linked with exhibits. This is the most common issue the examiner has. And what can you do to avoid it? Start your paragraph with a statement of fact from the exhibit. I call this opening sentence. So each point, each paragraph, you must always start from a statement of fact 
pick up from the exhibits. So once you copy paste the relevant sentence, and then you can build your argument from that point, right? So always keep in mind that whenever you are drafting your points, the first sentence should be a statement of fact from the exhibits. Automatically, then you can continue writing on those lines, right? The second issue is that the examiner says merely copy pasting material from the exhibits without adding own comments or explaining why the point is important. So you see a lot of brilliant students, they just copy paste and move on. It's not a copy pasting paper. You have to add your comments, right? So once you have the opening sentence, which you copy pasted from the exhibit, then you can explain the reason or the impact of the point on the business. You have to elaborate, right? You can talk about the impact, the reason, uh, basically, you have to explain to the examiner why this point is important or relevant. Understood? So your point, each point will have two things. One, the opening sentence, which will be copy-pasted from, from the exhibit. And then in continuation to that, you will have to explain that point that what is the relevant? What is going on in your mind? Why do you think you, why you have brought up this point? What's the impact? What's the reason? All right. Very, very important. Then a lot of students, they overspend time on one particular question, mostly question number one. It is called time trap. So time trap is a very common mistake done by the students under exam conditions. They kind of overspend the allowed time on one particular question, maybe because they panic or they are not able to, you know, complete it on time. So if the allowed time was 45 minutes, they spent like 60, 65 minutes without realizing that they are overdoing the time. This is called time trap, right? And the moment you fall in the time trap and you overspend the time in one particular question, basically you are hijacking the time of the other questions and ultimately what will happen towards the end, you will run out of time and you will not be able to attempt all the questions, right? So it's very important that you should not fall in the time trap. This normally happens in difficult questions. Whenever the question is difficult by nature, students panic, they stress out and they spend extra time without even realizing. How can you avoid it? Start with easier questions first. Do the difficult question in the last. All right. That's what you can do. Never start with a diff difficult question. If question number one is looks very crazy, or weird, don't start with it. Directly start with question number two, All right? The fourth reason is not completing the entire paper, bad time management. Obviously, it is critical that you have to attempt 100% if you want to pass SBL. It is next to impossible that you attempt 75 or 80 marks and you can pass SBL. Very, very rare. Very, very, you know. So please, you have to attempt 100% paper if you want to increase your chances of passing. So for that, you have to, you know, follow rigorous focus on time management. So what to do if the, if the allowed time is up and your question is still not complete? 
So you are writing a particular, answering a particular question and you are almost like 80% done, but the time is up. So please leave the question incomplete and move to the next question as soon as the time is up. That's very important. It requires a lot of courage. So just complete that one particular point or one paragraph, just complete that, leave some space and move to the next question. Do not overrun the time in any question under any circumstances. Otherwise, towards the end, you will be screwed. All right? Then the examiner says, poor technical knowledge. So what to do with this? Please watch my SBL top 25 important topics, videos and handouts. It's available freely on my Google Drive and YouTubes. Since you have very limited time, you cannot cover the entire syllabus, right? So please to uh, brush up your technical conceptual knowledge, just focus on the top 25 important topics. It, it will not cover everything, but at least on a 80-20 principle, since you have very limited time, just do the top 25 important topics to improve your technical knowledge, okay? Then the examiner says insufficient number of points according to the marks. This is also a very common thing that students are not writing enough points to justify the total marks. So for that, it's pretty simple. Calculate the number of points. So you've, and uh, how do you calculate or decide the number of points? Total marks divided by two. Once you calculate the number of points, make sure that you give, you're able to write that number of points, okay? If it is less marks, if it is a 10 marks question, you have to give five points. Don't go for six, right? And if it's a 20 marks question, you have to give 10 points, enough. Don't go for 11, okay? Then students not doing practice or mocks on the CBE platform. That's pretty straightforward. What's the solution? Solve questions directly on the CBE platform. Some students, they don't solve the questions on the CBE platform. They download a PDF version of the question paper and they solve it on Microsoft Word. Some students who are doing revision kits, they do it on a paper, they do it mentally, they do it visually, verbally. No. For SBL, you have to do practice directly on the CBE platform. There are so many past papers, practice papers, specimen papers. Please practice on directly on the CBE platform, okay? And the last one is weak typing and formatting skills, like uh, spelling errors, uh, bad formatting. This will also come through practice. The more you will practice on the CBE platform, your speed will improve, your grip on the formatting will improve, your typing uh, errors will reduce. All right, so these are the eight most common mistakes. As per the examiner, this is not as per me. And I've given you the strategy, the solutions, how you can avoid this if you want to pass SBL. Is there any question on this slide before I move forward? Any questions so far? Because this was a very important thing especially for self-study students. My paid batch students are pretty much aware of this and we are focusing all on this. All right, good. Any general questions I will take in the end. So just hold for
for a few minutes. Right, so exam changes in SBL from September. So as you are aware that now SBL has moved to a model called pre-seen, right? As September was the first attempt and December will be the second attempt of the new pre-seen format. So, you know, I just thought that I will uh, summarize the changes so that everybody is on the same page and there is no confusion, right? So first of all, there is no change in the syllabus, only paper pattern has changed, okay? The case study will be published two weeks before the exam. Additional information or exhibits as well as the task will be given on the exam day. There will be total three tasks and three or maximum four exhibits. Okay, previously there used to be five or six questions and seven to eight exhibits, but now they have reduced the number of questions. There will be just three tasks with subparts and there will be three or four exhibits. Generally, I've seen three, maximum four. Paper duration has been reduced to three hours and 15 minutes because much of the background information has been provided in advance and the number of exhibits have reduced. So obviously, if the background has been published two weeks before and you have read it and the number of exhibits is only three out of seven or eight, then you don't need four hours. So they have uh, subtracted the extra reading time because they are sharing the material in advance and they've reduced the number of exhibits, right? So nothing to worry about. Three hours and 15 minutes is okay. Each professional skill will be tested only once and will be worth four marks. That's straightforward. And previously it was tested uh, two marks each several times, but now it will be just tested once in each question. Task will no longer be answered in a single word response tool. Each task has a separate answer sheet. That's pretty straightforward. Pre-seen material will also be available in the CBE platform on your exam day. So what you will also have access to the pre-seen material on your exam day. So it will be there, right? Since there is no change in the syllabus, all past exam paper practice is 100% applicable. So I get this question a lot of time that is the past papers relevant? Absolutely yes, because there is no change in the syllabus, okay? So, so this is a bit about the pre-seen things. What are the advantages and the disadvantages of this? So I think the advantages are more. So we will know exactly which industry is case study from. So we will know in advance so we can prepare for it. And we can also try and predict possible questions beforehand. We will try to guess what can be the possible questions, what can be the pestle, what can be the porter, what can be the sword, what can be the risks, what can be the governance issues. So, you know, all the important topics, you can mentally uh, design or make some draft points in your head based on the pre-seen material. So that kinds of makes your life easy and a bit more predictable, right? What's the con since it's the second attempt with the new paper, there will be some uncertainty and learning curve involved, right? So any questions so far?
I will, I've got some questions. I will answer them uh, in the next slide. It's all included there. So let's have a quick look at the pre-seed paper format for those students who are doing it for the first time. Uh, just let's spend a couple of minutes on the CBE paper. So I will log in to the practice platform. It's a bit slow as usual. Okay, I will click on strategic business leader, ACCA official resources. Let's look at specimen exam, specimen exam one. I will assign it and then I will look for it. Where is it? So when you will open your CBE platform, this is the first screen you will see. On the left, you will see exhibits. In this particular case study, there are four exhibits. You click on the exhibit and it will open up and you can read the exhibit. You can highlight the exhibit, right? After the exhibits here, you will see the pre-seen information. So the same, case study which was published two weeks ago, a copy of that is also available here for quick reference. So the entire pre-seen material will also be accessible here. So you can read it again or pick up some points from it. Then there is task. Task means question. So task number one is 34 marks. And then there is the word response response option, the word processor, spreadsheet, and slides. So we will be using the word processor to draft our answer, right? And no need for using spreadsheet in SBL, stay away from spreadsheet. And if any slides are required, then you can use the slides and you can use the slide and you can type into the slides and speaker notes. All right. So if you notice, there is just one task here. Where are the remaining two tasks? So for that, you will have to go to the next page. So you see the, the thing next. Once you click next, it will go there. So I will have to first scroll down. So I will just scroll down to the end. <laughs> and then next. The moment I do next, everything will be same, only the question will change. Now you can see task number two. You will have to solve task number two using this word processor. And then again, you will do next. And here you will see task number three. That's it. Okay. Any questions on the CBE platform? All right, so it's pretty standard, pretty straightforward, uh, nothing to worry about, right? Now the pre-seen material for December will be published on 21st of November. This is the date from ACCA that your pre-seen material will be published on November 21st you will receive an email notification once it's available on the ACCA portal, okay? So then you will have to log into your portal and download it, understood? So this is the process of how you can download, you, can, you have to go to 
the exam planner, click on your SBL book exam in your plan, click on the download links for the pre-seen information. Okay. And there is a small video as well on how to do it if you are facing any problem. Right. So on November 21st, uh, you will get an email notification. Based on that, you have to log into your portal and download the paper from there. Guys, please don't ask irrelevant questions which are not pertaining to the slide under discussion. I will take all these questions towards the end. Okay, please restrict your questions to the slide under discussion. This is for Hina. Bryna, Wisdom, all you guys, okay? Restrict your question to the slide under discussion. All these questions I will take towards the end, okay? Now, so I will be conducting a separate workshop on the pre-seen material once it's published. Right. A lot of students, uh, you know, had requested that I have I conduct a separate webinar. So the workshop on pre-scene will be held on 28th and 29th of November, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Pakistan time. OK, and the recording will be available for later viewing. The workshop will include a detailed discussion and understanding of the case study, a summary of pointers for quick revision. We will be discussing possible questions and possible answers. And there will be a grand revision three days before the exam. Because so there's a small investment in this workshop. So if Without grand revision, if you don't want this revision, just you just want the pre-scene discussion, then it's $25 and a separate price for Pakistan-based students. And if you want with grand revision, then the price is $40. And this is the price for Pakistan-based students. And all those students who are already enrolled with me, regular batch, recent batch, or the revision batch, this is all included in your package. This is only for those self-students who don't want to enroll in any of the paid batch, then you can separately enroll for pre-seen material and grand revisions, all right? If you want any details for admission and inquiries, this is the number. Right. Are you guys now ready for a question solving? Really? No, guys, you are not ready. What about the formats? We have to first go through all the formats, right? Because almost all question requires a particular format. So the most common format, most frequently asked format is a report or a briefing paper or a briefing note or a memo. This is the most frequently asked format. And you have to be very hands-on with it, right? So it's a very straightforward, easy format. Just you have to get a hang of it too. There will be a to, there will be a from, there will be a subject, and there will be a date. Now, regarding the date, there are two possibilities. If any date is mentioned in the scenario or the exhibits, then we will use that date. Okay. And in case no date is mentioned in the scenarios or the exhibit, then instead of writing the actual date, we will write today. Is that clear? 
After these four things, in the next line, we will have a short introduction. This report or briefing paper, as the case may be, and then you can copy paste the requirement for the question. It will become your introduction, a two liner introduction about what this report is all about. After that, your main answers will start the main headings, the subheadings, your points. So from here till here is the format and here will be your actual answer. And once you have completed your answer, you will write, you will need to write a closure. You can write best regards and your role. Okay, a very standard basic format. Now, are we supposed to give any conclusions or recommendations towards the end of the report? No. Please avoid conclusions or recommendations unless the question specifically mentions conclude or recommend. If the question is silent, then please avoid conclusion and recommendation because it will take a lot of extra time and your time management will be at risk. All right. All right. Okay. Now the next format is something called section of a report. Sometimes the examiner doesn't want a full report. He just says draft a section of a report. So it's very simple. You will give the heading section of a report. No to, no from, no subject, no date. You will just give a introduction, two-liner introduction. This section of a report analyzes blah, 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 blah. And then you will dive straight into your answer. And then you will give a closure. Very simple format, okay? Because it's an extract sort of full report, it's a section of a report. The third format which is tested in your exam is email. The question will say draft an email for the finance director. So again, it's pretty simple. Your heading will be email to from subject date and then this email, you give an opening sentence, and then the main headings, main answer, and then the closure. Okay. Now, most of the time, uh, you are asked to prepare a presentation slide. All right. <laughs> a presentation slide. So on your CVE platform, there is a separate template for presentation slide. Okay. So, so every presentation has two components. Listen very carefully. Every presentation has two components. One is the actual slide, this one. And the second component is the supporting notes or accompanying notes. So each slide, each slide will have two parts. The main presentation, which will basically be based on bullet points. And the second portion will be the explanatory notes in which you will explain the bullets. So if there are three bullets, there will be three paras. Okay. So each para you will have to explain. But the only difference is the bullets are mentioned on the slide and the explanation is mentioned under the supporting notes. It's clear. Just I will again show you the CBE platform. If the question says prepare a presentation slide, you will click on the slides option. You will not use the word processor, but you have to use the slides. 
Once you click on the slides, this template will open up. So you see slide number one, and you will write the, the bullets here, right? Your bullets here. And under speaker notes, you will explain the bullets in paragraph forms. And then you will go to the slide number two. Normally two slides are there. Slide number two, again, the same thing. The bullets will be on the slide and the explanation will be on the speaker notes. All right. Then very uh, one or two times the question has asked you to draft a letter. So letter format, you know, you already know from your school times how to write a letter. There will be a heading on the top, then the date, then the addressee, the name of the company, the subject, dear sir, this letter, opening sentence, and then the headings uh, will come. And then the best regards and everything, right? Then there is something called a press release or a website release. This also has been tested, I think, one or two times in the last three or four years. A press release or a website release. So you will give the heading press release or website release. Subject, name of chairman or CEO, name of company and date. So just imagine that this is being published on the newspaper. So in the newspaper, the company wants to make an announcement. It's a press release. So that, you know, the, 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 the heading, heading, the name of the company, the name of the person, like the chairman or the CEO and the date, and the opening sentence will be through this press release. We would like to share our views and then blah, blah, blah. Then your main answer will come. And this is the closure. For further information, please contact our public relations department. So this is something you keep in mind that this is being published in a newspaper for you know informing the general public. So this is the format. Then there is something called a business case. So this is a, a topic under project management. So if you're asked to prepare a business case, there are three broad headings in a business case. You will need to summarize the current situation. It will be given to you. You will need to evaluate the various options. The, the options will be given to you. You will need to talk about the pros and cons of the options. And in the end, which option are you selecting and why? So these are the three broad headings of a business case document, current situation, various options, and selected option. Okay. Now, the la the another document is called Project Initiation Document. It's also called PID. Again, it pertains from the Project Management Chapter, Project Initiation Document. So it's a specific documents for relating to a project, and there are standard headings which needs to be included. So a PID, you will need to include a scope and objective, cost-benefit analysis, project sponsor, project manager, project team, other stakeholders, duration, what are the key risks, constraints, project governance, and monitoring procedures. So these are the typical 
uh, items which needs to be discussed in a project initiation document. So far in your exam, you have never been asked to prepare a PID. In one of the questions, a PID was given to you and you were supposed to identify the mistakes or errors or omissions from that document. So if you will need to memorize these headings so that you are able to handle a question on project initiation document, okay? Now, this topic is very frequent. Identify weakness and give recommendation. This topic, this one, and this topic is also very frequent. Identify the risks and give recommendation. So whenever you get this kind of a question, please use a tabular format to simplify your answer. On one column, the left column, you can talk about the weakness. And on the other column, you will talk about its recommendation. Similarly for risks, if it's a question on risk, you will first talk about the risks on the left side and then you can mention the recommendations on the right side. Using a tabular format will speed up your things and it will, you know, uh, simplify things for you under exam conditions. Okay. Sometimes the table format in the CB platform doesn't work. Okay. Sometimes the table format doesn't work. In that case, obviously, you will not be able to make a table, right? So then in that scenario, you can uh, use the paragraph style, the weakness recommendation, weakness recommendation, okay, paragraph style. But if the table format is working, uh, then please use a table format even if it's part of a report, doesn't matter. Even in a report, you can insert a table, a two-column table, and, and present your answer like this. Okay? It will really simplify under exam conditions. And this is a most frequent topic. Okay? In almost every attempt, there is a question on weakness and risks. All right, so we are done with the format, report, briefing paper, memos, uh, email, letter, section of a report, uh, press release, business case, PIDs, weakness and recommendation. Now are we ready for the question solving? No, you're not ready, very smart. Another very important thing is professional marks. Can anybody remind me how much is professional marks out of 100? Yes, absolutely correct. 20 marks out of 100. So I would say 20% of your paper is professional skills. And that's sure shot. We know that it will be there. One-fifth of your paper is professional skills, right? So you really have to focus on that. I normally call them cash marks. The cash marks, there is no topic involved. There is no model involved. There is no scenario involved. If you know the technique, it is easy marks, low-hanging fruit. So I think you should aim to score at least... 14 or 15 marks out of 20. 20 out of 20 is not possible because it's a theoretical paper, right? But at least you should aim to score a minimum 14 to 15 marks out of 20 so that you get a strong start, okay? So professional skills. So there are five professional skills in SBL. And all of them are well-defined and they're easy to apply, okay? 
What are the five professional skills? Evaluation skill, analysis skills, communication skill, commercial acumen skill, and skepticism skill. Okay, each task will clearly tell you which particular skill you need to demonstrate. All right. So let me explain each skill one by one. I will not go into philosophical and lengthy discussions. I will just keep it simple from an exam point of view. Right. Evaluation skill means you have to evaluate the situation. Basically, if you want to score good marks in evaluation, just make sure you cover both pros and cons in your answer. You have to include both pros and cons in your answer. What is pros and cons? Advantages and disadvantages. Plus points, minus points. Positive points, negative points. You have to cover both sides in your answer. Is that clear? So if you want to score evaluation skill, make sure that you include both pros and cons in your answer. That's the first thing. Now, what should be the mix or breakup of pros and cons? For example, if I'm if it's a 20 marks question, so I'm supposed to write 10 points, right? So if so, am I expected to write five pros and five cons? What do you think? No. It's not like you have to give half advantages and half disadvantages. It all depends on the availability of information in the exhibit. I have to pick up points from the exhibits. It depends on the information. If there are more pros, I will write seven pros, eight pros and two cons. That's fine. If there are more cons, like seven or eight negative points and only one or two positive points, that is also fine. So the mix is not important. What is important is that you have to include both pros and cons in your answer. Okay. So if I ask you, let's let's do a quick one. If I ask you, please evaluate ACCA. Please evaluate ACCA degrees. What are the pros? Can you think of some pros? Mohammad Hamza, I'm asking about pros, not the cons. Jamal, what the fuck? I'm asking about pros. You don't know what pros is? The advantages. So what are the pros? What are the advantages of ACCA degree? It's global. It's futuristic. It is well known. It's shorter period. There are exemptions. It's flexible. Uh, you can get a good job. It's reputable. Yeah. But that's one side of the story, right? If we are supposed to evaluate it, we have to give the complete picture to the board. So now, what are the cons of ACCA? It is expensive, it especially, you know, it is difficult, it may take a lot of time, exams are hard, there are problems in the CBE system during the exam, you might require some experience, exchange rate is perfect. So this is a good evaluation. Evaluation means pros and cons, a complete 360 degree evaluation picture. Now you understand now? Understood what is evaluation skill? You need to discuss both pros and cons. The quantity or the mix doesn't matter. It all depends on the information. 
All right, let's move on to the next one. Analysis skills. Again, very simple. When you are asked to de demonstrate analysis skills, basically you have to give reasons, investigate the reasons. You have to, analysis is in, investigate the reasons why this is happening. What is the root cause? So for example, Let's say the staff turnover has increased. The staff turnover has increased. What can be the reasons? Can you investigate and let me know what are the reasons why? What is the root cause? Why staff turnover has increased? Let me know. Poor pay packages, low salary, low motivation, poor leadership, poor culture. Right, health and safety, very good. Office politics, late sittings, no leaves, discrimination, good one. You see, so this is this is analysis. So when you investigate the underlying reasons. When you investigate the underlying reasons why this is happening, that's analysis. The reasons for variance. Okay, the root cause. Understood? So whenever you're supposed to analyze, you will look at the exhibits and identify the reasons why this is happening. Okay, one more example. Our sales revenue has fallen. Is that good or bad? First, let me know. Our sales or revenue has fallen significantly. That's bad, right? Our top line or revenues has fallen. Please analyze. Why the sales revenue has gone down? Because of less volumes, poor quality, tough competition, economic situation, lower spending power, bad marketing, bad reputation, poor customer service. Maybe we have increased the price so customers have moved to cheaper options, better substitutes available. Very good answers. Recession. Very nice. So you have done analysis. So analysis skills is basically when you identify the underlying reasons of why this thing is happening. What is the root cause? You investigate. All right. Very good. The third skill is communication skill. It's pretty easy. In communication skill, you need to keep in mind who, whom you are writing to. Okay? What is your role and whom you are writing to? Your tone. So what is your role? So there are two possibilities. Either you are an employee of the company, which means you are an insider, or you are a management consultant or an external consultant, which means you are an outsider, right? So when you are an insider, your drafting tone will be according to that you are an employee. You will say we, us, right? Internal tone. And if you are an outsider, then you will draft like a third party, like you. Okay, is that clear? Based on your role, uh, you need to draft your tone of your answer should reflect your role, whether you are an insider or an outsider. Second thing is you need to keep the reader or the addressee in mind, whom you are writing to. Is it the CEO? 
Is it a non-executive director? Are you writing to the finance director? Are you writing to the full board? So your language, your tone should be according to the reader so that they understand your point. Okay. Most of the readers, majority of the readers are non-financial people. Okay. Like the CEO is a non-finance person. The board is a non-finance person. NEDs are non-finance people. Only the CFO or the finance director is a finance person. But most of the time, majority of the readers are non-finance. So you have to make sure that your language uh, is such that they are able to understand your point. Okay. So... To be all very honest, nothing extra needs to be done. You just keep in mind your role and simply draft your points in simple language and that's about it. Okay. So when I will be drafting, I will, uh, with, I, when I will be solving questions, you know, you will see it's very simple, basic language drafting. As long as you keep your role in mind, the format is okay and your tone is okay, you will get communication skill. Nothing extra needs to be done. Guys, all of you, please turn off your camera, okay? Please, all of you, turn off your video cameras because it's distracting some students, all right? If you don't mind. Uh, Barakatullah, please shut down your camera, please. All right. The fourth one is commercial acumen skill. Commercial acumen means that you have a, a wider understanding of the business. You are just not an accountant you have a wider understanding of the larger business. Okay. So as I said in the start, whenever you do SBL, think that you are the CFO. Keep that in mind, right? So the moment, you know, you think like a CFO, you will understand the bigger picture. So do you guys think do you guys think that a CFO should have an understanding of the entire wider business? Yes or no? Do you think it's important for a good CFO to understand all aspects of the business? Absolutely, yes. Otherwise, how he will prepare the budgets? How he will understand the PL? All right. So Always a finance leader needs to understand the larger business aspects. When it's not difficult, you can you need to understand the revenues, marketing, competition, HR, IT, just these basic words is enough. For example, you know. Everybody has commercial acumen, including you guys, but you don't you just don't realize it. So if I ask you, is it important? What will happen if the staff, what will happen on the quality of the product if my staff is demotivated? What do you think? What will happen? to the quality of my products if my staff are demotivated. The quality will improve or the quality will fall. That's commercial sense. That's common sense, right? That's commercial acumen. So now what will happen? Next question. What will happen if the quality of my product falls. What is the next impact? The rev the customers will move, right? Our sales will decline. If Obviously, if our quality is bad, we will start seeing a drop 
in our revenues and our number of customers. This is commercial acumen. Also, it will affect our reputation. Yes, good point. Reputational loss, revenue loss, fall in market share. This is all commercial acumen. Good. So coming back, commercial acumen just means that you are, just don't talk like an accountant. Don't talk about debit and credit and gearing and all those things. There are bigger picture like revenues, market share, competition, technology, e-business, HR, customers, production, operational matters. Just use these, you know, when you talk about the impact on these things, automatically you are demonstrating commercial acumen. So again, you don't need to do anything extra. Just talk about the impact on various parts of the business. The moment you talk about customers and employees and revenues, market share, competition, IT, you are automatically demonstrating commercial acumen. Okay, understood? So, so far we have done four professional skills, evaluation skills, analysis skills, communication skills, and commercial acumen. To be honest, nothing extra needs to be done. Just follow the small techniques I have discussed and you will get marks. The last one is skepticism skill. What is the meaning of the word skepticism? Do you know? What does it mean, skepticism? <laughs> Questioning mind. Skepticism means you have a probing mind or a questioning mind. You are not an idiot. You will not uh, accept anything on face value. You should ask some questions, some challenge the person to make sure that, you know, the information is correct. Challenging someone, asking questions, probing. Why? How? All these things, right? So, how can you demonstrate skepticism skills in your exam? Try to ask one or two questions. When you are drafting, ask a question. Put a question mark. The moment you ask a question with a question mark, you will get marks. You can ask question or you can challenge. Challenge means that you disagree. So you can see, you can say that I disagree with marketing director's comments because blah, 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 blah. So when you disagree, that is also skepticism. When you ask question, that is also skepticism. When you adopt a negative tone, a questioning tone, a challenging tone, it's skepticism. Understood? So I feel that only under skepticism skills, you need to change your drafting a bit. Instead of a positive tone of drafting, you have to adopt a questioning tone, a challenging tone of drafting. All right? You have to keep that in mind. Most students during exam stress, they forget to adopt a questioning tone for a professional skill aspect. All right, now you guys are ready. No? Yes, we've done the formats. We've done the, the professional skills. No, 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 no. There's one more thing. One more thing. Exam techniques. So guys, uh, Shall we take a break? 
Hmm? Shall we take a, a, a small break and then uh, we come back and continue? All right. So let's take a 15 minute break. It is 7.15 p.m. here. So 7.30 p.m. I will resume, okay? All right, so 15 minute break. All right, guys, can we start? Am I audible? All right, very good. So a very, very important aspect is exam techniques. SBL is all about exam techniques. How you handle those four hours or three hours and 15 minutes, right? Those students who are able to uh, manage their exam techniques properly, they easily pass. But those students who stress out and they mess with the techniques, they don't pass. So exam technique is basically the difference between pass and fail, right? So first of all, time management. So we all know that the total allowed time is three hours and 15 minutes, right? So out of that, you can allocate reading and planning time 15 minutes. And the rest should be your drafting time. Is that clear? The first 15 minutes is reading and planning. So now once you open the paper, what should you do in the first 15 minutes? Here is the list. The moment you open the paper, the first thing is copy paste all tasks in the scratch pad. Why? Because you see, if you recall the CBE platform, the tasks are not in one place. This task number three, you have to scroll down, go back to task number two, and then task number one. All right, so the tasks are not in one place and it is very important to keep the tasks in mind while reading the exhibits, right? So it's easier if you can bring all the tasks on one page so that you can go through them again and again if required, so that when you are reading the exhibits and you forget any task, you just go to the scratch pad and look at the task. So once you have copy pasted the tasks, then you have to read the tasks and identify the topics. Okay. The purpose of reading the task is we know what are the topics, what are the things we need to look for. Mentally, it will give us a plan, right? Then once we are, we, once we know the task, we will take a quick look at each exhibit and note the exhibit number on the scratch pad under the respective task. 
do not read the exhibits in detail. So the purpose here is not to ex read the exhibits in detail because um, it will not be finished in 15 minutes, right? But just to have a quick look at the exhibit, what is the heading of the exhibit, what it talks about, so that you are able to map it that this exhibit pertains to which task, all right? And then lastly, you decide the sequence of your answers, which is basically easier question first. So all this is part of reading and planning, which is 15 minutes. Okay. So let me, let us do it. Let me show it to you. So when I open the paper, So this is task number one, okay? So I will open up my scratch pad. I will just copy the technical requirement, not the entire thing, only the technical requirement. Done. Then I will go to task number two. I will go to task number three. It will maximum take one minute, right? It's not a big deal. Once you start doing it again and again, you will get the hang of it. Only the technical requirement Nothing else, so that we know the topic. Yeah, so we've copy pasted the task. So now I will read the technical ones. It says prepare, prepare a report for the board which evaluates the opportunities and challenges with PSS must consider in relation to the proposed contract with Zealand Health. So there, you know, there is some proposed contract with Zealand Health and we are supposed to talk about the opportunities and challenges, pros and cons. Contract with Zealand Health. Prepare two presentation slides, which can be presented to the next board meeting, which explain the actions with PSS will need to take to comply with EMAS and outline the key areas which should be included in the environmental policy. Okay, something to do with EMAS and environmental policy. So we know that the second part is relating to a topic on environmental uh, thing. Repair briefing notes for the FD, which discuss how PSS can benefit from analyzing and using data from online customers and website visitors. Actually, you can bold it as well. Okay. So this one is relating to proposed contracts. So I'm just highlighting the topic and this one is EMAS and environmental policy. This one is data from online customers, uh, big data analytics, and internal control activities and recommend actions. Okay. 
And the third question is assess the issues raised in the staff in the survey. So some staff survey will be there. So issues you have to assess and recommend how talent management program can affect. So now I know the topics. One is Zealand Health proposal. One is EMS and environmental policy. Second question is about data and big data and internal control activities or weaknesses, staff survey and talent management program. Okay. Now I will go through the list of exhibits. So the first exhibit is contract terms to supply bed mattress. Which question is it relating to? Zealand Health. Very good. Do you know which question? Question number one. So I will write here Exhibit one, done. Staff survey results. Which question is staff survey results? You can judge from the name. Staff survey results. Okay, so I will go to question number three. This is exhibit two. Okay, email from the HR director. I'll just open it to see what it talks about. I have a feeling it will be about talent management program, but I will see subject, yeah, staff training and development. That's talent management. Okay, so there's a question on talent management. So I will uh, exhibit three. This one is exhibit three. And uh, fourth is email from finance director. What is it about? I will read the subject. Issues identified by the audit committee, data, internal control weaknesses. Very good. So there's a, this is exhibit four. So this one is internal control is exhibit four and data is also exhibit four. Done. So now I've list down the, all the requirements on one page. I've highlighted the topic so that I know exactly when I'm reading the exhibits, I am referring to the pre-scene, I exactly know what specific information I need to look for. And I've mapped or cross-referenced the four exhibits, right? That when I will attempt this question, I will read this exhibit and draft my answer. When I attempt this question, I will read exhibit two and draft my answer. So all this, it took me less than 10 minutes, right? Now, which question should I start with? I think this one looks easy, proposed contract. I just need to identify the pros and cons. EMAS policy, big data, internal control. This also looks straightforward to me. This one looks a bit tricky. I don't know, it's up to you which topic you are strong at. So you will keep the most difficult question towards the end. All right. Any questions on this approach? The what to do in the first 10 minutes? You just no need to copy marks. We will read the entire requirement in detail once we start the drafting. We will, we will have to read the entire requirement in detail when we actually start the drafting. We will read the background, the technical requirement, the professional skills. We will decide the number of points. Okay, someone is asking why we are using scratch pad and not Word. The Word document is 
will you know it 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 is a separate word document for each question it is there is no one centralized word document so you will not be able to come and paste it right but on scratch pad i have pasted everything but on word you will not be able to do it because there are three word documents There will be question which is not related to exhibit. It is possible, then it might be based on the pre-seen material. When there is no direct exhibit, then we will look at the pre-seen material, okay? All right. So we'll go back to the slide. So the first 15 minute is clear. It will usually take, take around 10 minutes. Then once you are done, you can directly start your drafting. For drafting, the allowed time is 1.8 minutes per total marks. So if it is a 10 marks question, you have 18 minutes. If you it's a 20 marks question, you have 36 minutes. And in this, it also you need to read the respective exhibit, right? So this drafting time includes the reading of the exhibit, identifying the points, bringing it to the answer sheet, and then making the format. And then, so it's too tight. It's a lot of thing needs to be done. So time management and speed is very important and it can only improve from practice. Now, what to do when the allowed time is up? You have to stop drafting and move to the next question as soon as the allowed drafting time is up. You just complete the point which you are in the middle of drafting and that's it. Forget about the remaining points and move to the next question. How can you keep track of the allowed time? You can write the target ending time in your Word tool to keep track of your time. So before you start drafting, you calculate the allowed time. You look at your watch and then you, so for example, if it is six o'clock and 40 minutes are allowed, you will write 640 and then you start drafting. The moment 640 happens, you will, Stop and you will move to the next question. Okay, scratch square paper is never marked. It is your rough paper. All right, now linking with the exhibits. The next thing. So any questions with time management? Sorry, I. it's an important topic. Any questions with time management? Three hours, 15 minutes. Planning and drafting. Uh, understood everybody? All right. So second thing is linking your answer with the exhibit. It's very, very important that your answers are not general. They have to be linked in the context of the scenario. So you have to read the exhibit and copy paste important information on the respective answer sheet. Obviously, how will you link? You will read the exhibit. And for example, the question number one was identify the pros and cons of the, of the contract. So you will read that exhibit, you will identify the pros and the cons, copy paste those points on your answer sheet. Okay. Browse through the pre-seen material and copy paste relevant information on your answer sheet. Normally, 90% of the information will be in the exhibit. 90 to 95% of the information will be in the exhibit. Only five or 10% might be in the pre-scene. So you need to really focus on the exhibit and not the pre-scene. Wherever there is no information in the exhibit, obviously then I will use the pre-scene. But when there is a specific exhibit given, 
then 90 to 95 percent of your answer will come out from that exhibit. So you just copy paste the relevant information on your answer sheet and then start, as I said in the in the beginning, start your point with a statement of fact copied from the exhibit and then elaborate about its impact on the business. Okay, clear? The, it's very important that you get into this discipline of starting your answer from a statement of fact, which will come from your exhibit. All right. Number of points. So, you know, every question has technical marks plus professional marks. So, if you add these two, it will become total marks. All my strategies are based on total marks, okay? I'm not using technical marks. All my strategies are based on total marks. Is that clear? So normal question, we are assuming that one point is worth two marks. One, one point, a one well-drafted point is worth two marks. So for a 10 marks question, we need to write how many points? For a 10 marks question, how many points? Five, exactly five. Not five to six, who the hell is that? Exactly five, okay? If it's a 20 mark question, how many points? Exactly 10. Not 11, not 12, 10. If it's a 15 marks question, 7 to 8. Yeah, because 7.5, right? 7.5 is not possible. So either 7 points or 8 points depending on your time manager. Good. So what well-drafted point is worth Two marks. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Each point should be a separate para. Don't mix points in one para. So one para is considered as one point. If you have written. So if it's a 10 marks question. Listen carefully. If it is a 10 marks question. How many paras shall I see? How many paragraphs should I expect to see? Five paragraphs. Exactly. One point is one para. So if you are required five points, so I would expect to see five paragraphs. It's as simple as that. Now there is a, an exception. It's not really an exception, but sometimes the question asks you for two things. Okay, for example, it, it says identify the weakness and give recommendations. So these are two things. Number one, you have to um, identify the weakness and give recommendation. All right, so there are two things. So one point is weakness and one point is recommendation. So you have to give two points. Do you understand? One paragraph on weakness and one paragraph on recommendation. So this together will be considered as two points. And hence it will be worth four marks. Two marks for the weakness and two marks for the recommendation. Okay, for example, this, uh, this question, I saw this, uh, this one. It says, evaluate the potential impact of the weakness identified in the internal control activities 
and recommend actions. Identify the talk about the weakness and give rec. So these will be two points. One point for weakness, one point for recommendation. So two plus two, four. So how many points have I am I supposed to write here? Let me go back. I think it was question number two. No, I think it was question number one. What's happening? Which question was that? It's probably two. Yeah, it's basically, so what is the marks for this? Evaluate the potential impact of the weakness and recommend action. 12 marks plus 4 marks. 12 plus 4, 16. 16 divided by 4. So I need to identify 4 weakness. I need to identify 4 weakness and give 4 recommendations. So total 8 paragraphs, right? And, but I need to use a tabular format, remember? So I will weakness on one side and recommendation on other side. All right, good. Exactly same applies on risk and recommendation question as well. Same formula. So whenever there are two things required, identify the weakness and give recommendations or identify the risk and give recommendation, we will divide by four in order to calculate the number of weaknesses we are supposed to identify. Any questions? Yes, no. All right. Good. This is an intelligent batch. Format of your answer. The first thing is before I draft start drafting, I will prepare the skeleton of the answer. What is the skeleton of the answer? I will quickly prepare the format. So for example, if I'm starting question number one, I will prepare the format, whatever format has been required, a report or whatever. I will make the format. I will give broad headings. And then I will read the exhibits and start copy pasting on that. Okay, prepare the format and the broad headings first before you read the exhibit. All right, so you prepare the skeleton of the answer before you start attempting the question. Use information from the scenario to start your paragraph opening sentence. Adopt a paragraph style of writing. So each point is one para and maximum three lines per para, okay? Give subheadings for each point. This is very interesting. That if you are supposed to give five points, try to give a short subheading for each point so that the examiner knows what you are going to talk about. For example, if you want to talk about global revenue, in global sales and global revenue, you will write global revenue and then you explain. If you want to talk about higher costs or increase in costs, you will give the subheading increase costs. Sorry guys, just a minute. Sorry guys, that was my wife calling, so I cannot skip that, right? So try to give subheadings to each and every point. And later on, I will tell you why. 
leave one line between each paragraph. That's very important. Because if you don't leave lines between each paragraph, number one, it's unprofessional presentation. And number two, the examiner might not be able to clearly count the number of paragraphs if they are all stuck together. So always leave one line between each paragraph. All you need to do is press enter two times. When you press enter two times, it will go to the next line, right? Look for stress words in the exhibits. So when you are reading the exhibit and if you see a stress word, what is a stress word? Stress word is significant, very, extremely, notably. These are, these are examples of stress words. So when you see these points, this means that the examiner is placing extra importance to that sentence. For example, the competition is extremely tough. And it means it's a, it's a big thing. It's a major thing. So whenever you see a sentence with a stress word, always try to use that information in your answer because it's more relevant. It's more material. It's more, you know, big. Okay. Use tabular format for weakness and recommendation type questions and nil or minimum use of models. All right. So those of you who are already in my paid batch, you know how to prepare skeleton because in all, all our practice classes, we always start with preparing the skeleton of the answer. You know that uh, uh, always I, you know, how to give opening sentence, you know uh, how to give subheadings. We've been doing that in all of our life classes, right? But self-study students, you need to follow this. Any questions on this slide? Christine, I just gave a heading. I just gave a couple of examples. Like if you're talking about increased revenue, so just, mess, just the subheading will be increased revenue. And then you can elaborate. Or if you're talking about higher in, you know, intense competition, you can give the heading intense competition. Now, bouncer question. What is a bouncer question? A bouncer question is a question where there is no information in the exhibit or in the pre-scene and you don't know the answer or you don't know what to do. It, is, it goes over your head. It bounces off your head. You have absolutely no clue how to handle or how to answer that question because of lack of information primarily. So I call it bouncer question, okay? For example, if I go back to this scenario so there is exhibit one available so it's not a bouncer question for 1b it talks about emas and environmental policy i have not seen any direct exhibit so this may potentially be a bouncer question for this one uh, big data analytics there is exhibit four which i'm uh, i'm assuming that it will cover part A. For B, there is exhibit four. And for three A, there is exhibit two. And so wherever you can easily identify an exhibit, life is easier because you can use information from the exhibit. But in this EMAS question, it looks like a bouncer question. Right? So, uh, let me, so what do we do with a bouncer question? 
attempt this question in the last. So skip that. So for example, if you started with question number 1A, because it is straightforward, you can start with that. But when you come to 1B, don't do it. Move to the next question. You then directly go to 2A, 2B, then do 3A, then do 3B. And in the end, I will come back to handle this. Is that clear? Is that clear, all of you? The moment you have identified any question where there is no exhibit, I will declare that question as a bouncer question and I will skip that. If it's coming in between, I will skip and next move to the next question. I will not even spend two minutes on it. In the end, when I have 10, 15 minutes left, what I will do? I will come back. You know, you can try to define what is EMAS just to fill space. You can use search and find option on the CBE platform using keywords. So, you know, I will go to the pre-scene and I will try to search. So you see this magnifying glass? I will write EMAS. Nope, there is nothing on EMAS. I will write uh, environmental. Maybe I'm making a typing error. Environment. I think I'm making a spelling mistake somewhere. E N V I R O N M E N T. There are four things on environment. Environmental, there is one. Okay, I go to it. It's somewhere here. So you can try and search the word. One is political environment. No, it's not relevant. The other one is economic environment, not relevant. The third one is financial environment, no. And the fourth one is something else, yeah. So nothing. Right, so this is probably a bouncer question. So if you are not able to find anything from search find, I can just try to summarize the problem. If you read the requirement, there is some background given. There's always some background information available in the requirement. So let me see whether there is here, you see, this information is there. So for this question, there is no direct exhibit. I did not see anything in pre-scene, but there is a pre-background information. The chief executive is aware that the contract with Zealand Health is conditional upon complying with eco-management and audit scheme EMAS. He knows that an environmental policy is part of EMAS. As master, you know, so you just talk about what is environmental policy. Okay. What, what are the general things included in an environmental policy? You can just try and talk about it in general. But since it's a bouncer question, I will not worry about it. I, Anyways, I'm doing it towards the end. I have just 5, 10, 15 minutes for it. I will just make the format. I will just talk about environmental policy if I can link a little bit here and there. So what is an environmental policy? Environmental policy is, is environmental footprint. Okay, there is a social footprint and there is environmental footprint. So what are the three things included in environmental footprint? Let's see whether you have watched the top 25 or not. What are the three things included under environmental footprint? Very good. 
Very nice. So the three things which are included under environmental footprint is responsible use of scarce resources, waste products and recycling, carbon emission and pollution. These are the three broad things. So you can talk about these three things and I know that there is a lot of information in the pre-scene about these three things, recycling, carbon emission, all this is mentioned in the pre-scene. So as long as you know your top 25 topics, you know what to talk about under environmental policy, recycling, scarce resources, carbon emission, and there is information about these things in the pre-scene. So you can do something if not fully do the question, right? Understood what is a bouncer question and how to deal with it? Okay. Sometimes there can be two bouncer questions. Huh? Be mentally prepared. There is no rule that there will only be one. Sometimes there can be two bouncer questions. What will help you? Your theoretical knowledge will help you. Once you know the, the concept, once you know the broad things which are which should be included, then you can link with the pre-scene stuff. You can find related information on the pre-scene. Okay, it will only come through practice. All right. Now, we've done a lot of things today. We talked about why students, they fail SBL. Then we talked about the various formats. Then we learned the professional skills. And then we talked in detail about the exam techniques, the time management, how to link, how to decide the number of points, how to draft and format your answer, um, how to handle bouncer question. That's pretty much it. Now, since now you know the entire thing, let's see what global prize winners have done. Okay, let's learn from them. Let's learn how the global place winners have achieved 92 marks. So these are the two students, there are, these are the two gentlemen who had scored 92 marks, one in uh, March attempt and one in June. One is from South Africa, one is from Malaysia. And both of them had attended my webinar. They were not my paid student, okay? They were not my paid students, but they attended my webinar and they used my techniques, the all the techniques which I just discussed with you guys. They followed those techniques. They used my material, resources, top 25 notes, whatever is available, and they scored 92 marks. So number one, they, were, they are super intelligent. Uh, but other than that, um, what did they do actually? So I was really interested. Uh, yeah, right to know, so I, I interviewed both of them. I interviewed both of them in detail to understand how the hell they scored 92 marks, self-study students. So their tips I have divided between preparation stage and during the exam, okay? I have divided their strategies between the two. So how did they prepare? So right now you guys are in the preparation phase, right? Four weeks are left. So what uh, what did they do? So during the last four weeks, weeks focus on revising important topics only and not the entire syllabus. That's the first thing they did. In the last four weeks, they just revised the important topics 
and not the entire syllabus. Basically, they use my top 25 videos and notes. Second thing, give at least four hours each day during last four weeks. This was common in both of them that they used to give at least four to five hours each day to SBL. Okay. Now, one of them was a working student. So he said that I'm, I'm not able to give straight four hours. So what he used to do was he used to give two hours in the morning before going to work. He used to get up at six, six to eight, he used to study. And then he went to work and then two hours in the evening. All right. So the, the point is you have to give at, invest at least three, four to five hours each day. Whether you can do in one go or you can do in two phases, up to you. Then they said that they focus 20% on theory and 80% on practice. So during the last four weeks, if they allocate their time, so only 20% on theory and important topics, but 80% of their time, they were actually practicing on the CBE platform. How much time are you giving to the CBE platform? How much time are you giving to theory or syllabus versus practice? Be honest, let me know. Are you focusing more on syllabus and less on practice? I know. So during the last four weeks, 20% of your time on syllabus and 80% on practice, okay? That's the secret. Then do eight to 10 case studies, including five time-based mocks. So they solved eight to 10 case studies, out of which five was under time-based mock. Then they said, don't read examiner's answer. It is for educational purpose only. It's not practical, practical for exam condition. So they just use my drafted answer to check their answers. So I have my own drafted answers. It's available on my Google Drive. Uh, so don't use examiner's answers because that is for educational purposes. During the last four weeks, the time for educational purpose is over. Now it's more exam focused. And none of them, they never used book or revision kit. Both of them, they never used any book, any revision kit. They just used my summarized notes and the CBE platform for practicing all the past papers. All right. Um, my Google Drive. Okay, I will share the link on the WhatsApp groups. Thank you, Paul has just shared the link. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate. Right, guys, any questions on the preparation strategy used by the two global winners? Right. So the whole bottom line is you have to give four hours from now on and you have to focus 80% on practice and 20% on syllabus. Okay, you have to change the gears. Now, during the exam, what did they do? This was there and you can see it's a long list. First of all, both of them said that attempt easy questions first. And then both of them rigorous focus on time management. The moment their time was up, they moved to the next question. They left their question incomplete and they moved to the next question. It requires a lot of guts, but the proof is there. These guys scored 92 marks. Then they said something interesting. Try and think of a real life example from the same industry. So for example, in your previous attempt, it was an airline. So obviously some of you 
or most of you must have traveled in an airline in some point in time, whether a domestic flight or an international flight. So just think of a real life experience, real life exam, uh, you know, example. It might help you handle the scenario. Then they said, use information from the scenario to start your point. Exactly. You know, the opening sentence. Then they said, give one extra point for each question, but remaining within the allowed time. So they were, they were fast readers. They were fast in typing. So they tried to give one extra point. For example, if it's a 10 mark question, Instead of giving five points, they gave, they tried and gave six points, but they did not overrun the time. If the time was up, then forget it. And then max three to four sentence per point. Their answers were pretty short and to the point, three to four lines in <laughs> per paragraph, okay? To keep your answers short because you will struggle with time management. Both of them gave short subheadings for each point. You see why I was suggesting that you give subheadings? Because both the global prize winners, they gave subheadings. No or very less use of models. Then they said technical knowledge is not important. Application of knowledge is main focus. So they were applying on the scenario. They were not giving general answers or theoretical answers. They were applying that knowledge on the scenario to give scenario-based solutions. Use professional language. Think like a CFO. These are exactly their words. Huh? So I just thought I will summarize their strategies so that you can pick up few for your own sake. If you want to uh, look at the interview with these prize winners, it is available on YouTube. Yeah, you know, um, I, I have saved it on YouTube so that um, students can take advantage. Okay. Any questions on the tips from global prize winners? So Maruk is asking no or very less use of models. What does that mean? So you see, there are a lot of models in your syllabus. Okay. And a lot of students, they try to use models unnecessarily. You know, you should not use models unnecessarily because models, number one, takes time in drafting and number two, it might get a bit complicated and you might get stuck during the model. The examiner actually is not interested in the model. He's interested in your answer, right? So as long as you're able to give logical answers without using a model, you will still get marks. So both these global prize winners, they did not use any model. They just gave simple logical answers linked with the scenario. That's the meaning of no or minimum use of models. The models are part of your syllabus because it will clear your concept. You can think about the models in your head to, to develop the approach and your answer, but you don't have to use the model in your draft. You can keep it in your mind so that it helps you identify the points and frame your answer, right? If you don't know pastel, let's say pastel. If you don't know pastel, then you will not be able to uh, do a question on environmental analysis. But if you know pastel, you will quickly be able to draft, right? 
I will share this handout in the group after the class. So don't worry. I will share this today's handout in all the groups after the class. Okay. All right. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm done with today. So just a small announcement that my revision batch is starting from 7th November. So that as soon as the webinar is finished, webinar is Saturday and Sunday. Monday, there is a break. And from Tuesday, 7th November, my revision drafting batch is starting. It's a paid batch and it will focus on all these things. So, you know, professional marks, exam techniques, linking. We will be solving around four case studies in full in live class. And we will be doing three mocks. So in total, we will be doing seven past papers or seven case studies in the revision batch. And I will also check one mock script for each student who will uh, and give you marks and feedback. Okay. All classes will be recorded for later viewing. If you have a time zone difference, you can watch the recording on the next day. Plus, it also includes a detailed discussion and practice of pre-seen material and grand revision. So this batch is starting from in three days time. The investment is USD 105 and for Pakistan based students, it's 15,000 something in rupees. Uh, if you are a reset student or even if you are a first time student, this batch is exam focused, practice drafting focused batch. It will really help you. For those students who are already enrolled in my regular batch or reset batch, it's all included in your package. Everything is there. But those of you who have not enrolled in any of my paid batch as yet, then you can have enrolled in this, right? It will be really, really helpful. This is the schedule of the revision classes. It's pretty intense. You can see, um, you know, we will be doing EX Marine on 7th and 8th of November, then Optima on 10th and 11th. Classes are at, they will start at 7 p.m. Pakistan time on a working day and on a weekend, it will be 4 p.m. Pakistan time. And you can see there is one mock, two mock, and three mocks. And then you can see there is a pre-scene discussion and a grand revision. So pretty intense. All right. So this is the schedule. All right. So that's it from now. Today we did not do any questions because I wanted to focus on the basics first the professional skills, the exam formats, and all those things, so that tomorrow we can do a couple of questions applying all these techniques, right? Okay, so now I am open for any questions. So any kind of questions which I may have missed, you can ask me now. Are the classes recorded? Absolutely, yes. Each and every class is recorded and the recording will be available the next afternoon. Is there any changes in the requirement after September? No change. Vasu, yes, you are correct. What technical articles? I will cover technical articles tomorrow. Okay. Aditya, should we start solving the past papers now or after practice life classes? Okay, good question. So those students who are part of my paid batch, you should not solve the questions on your own right now. Wait for the life classes. Once you get a hang of it, then I will you know, guide you. Don't attempt questions on your own. This is for my paid batch. For self-study batch, since you're on your own, you can start solving and applying these things. But for my paid batch students, 
wait a bit don't solve these questions on your own otherwise you will kill the suspense we will do these questions in the live classes whatsapp group is full okay i don't know uh, maybe i will then create a new group and i will share it tomorrow I will be checking one script free of cost for the paid students. If you want additional script to be checked, there is some nominal fees for additional script because it takes 20 to 25 minutes per script, right? Hamza, I will... Uh, so those of you who have not started studying right now, uh, I will share a study plan tomorrow, okay, for those students who have not yet started and you are a self-study self student, I will share the study plan tomorrow's webinar. Where can we enroll for this crash course? I have given the number. It's so simple. It's all mentioned here. For inquiries and admission, message on this number. Come on. For people who just want to join only the pre-scene, yes, that is also an option. I mentioned earlier that for pre-scene, it is $40 including grand revision and $25 if you don't want the grand revision, okay? Uh, I'm just going through the comments. Talha, it's a bit difficult because I have selected the best questions, right? So the seven questions which I have selected are the best questions. They are all rounder questions. The questions which I have not selected are not that good questions. Am I a SBL marker? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not a SBL marker. That would be a conflict of interest. Uh, Sudevan, no, there is no issue. Please message my uh, coordinator on the number and they will guide you. All right, guys. So I guess that's about it. Uh, today was day one. Tomorrow is day two. So tomorrow's focus is technical articles. We will solve one or two questions and then the study plans. Okay. So I will see you guys tomorrow, same time, 6 p.m. Pakistan time. And I will share the handout of tonight's class after the class. And do join me tomorrow as well. All right, guys. I hope today was helpful to you. And if some questions are still unanswered, I can answer them tomorrow. All right, guys. Yeah, the same link. Tomorrow is the same link. All right, guys, take care and good night.